Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kupadam Rama, and I'm an architect. I uh, live and work in the United Kingdom in London. I am a founder and director of Forum Group. Uh, our main uh, studio is in London. We also have a branch here in Kosovo, in Pristina. Uh, it has been a, a great pleasure actually being here for the past week. I've been here since Sunday, so I've been working with some uh, very um, uh, interesting and intelligent students for the past week, and we've been uh, doing some analysis of the green market. And I've also had a pleasure to work with uh, Maria uh, from Italy, and so uh, it's, been, it's been a great week. Uh, we've been discussing several subjects and obviously focusing um, on the topic of the um, Eco Week on uh, sustainable and green architecture. And what, you know, the question that we were discussing is that what is actually the um, green architecture or sustainable architecture? What do we mean by uh, green architecture and sustainable architecture? And um, over the years, the meaning of the sustainable architecture, the green architecture, has um, you know, been shifting from uh, initially being related to uh, only the quantitative measure of energy efficiency to uh, then um, you know, being linked to actually uh, PhDs and sort of specialists dealing with it only to uh, what it now uh, defined as um, being about improving the life of society and uh, being a part of our everyday life, so being a kind of a relationship between human beings and nature. So the sustainable uh, sustainability and green architecture, um, just want to point out that actually it's, it's, it's not what it was. And, and um, uh, when we look at the city of Pristina today, uh, we find that it's, it's in a very dire sort of environmental uh, conditions. Um, the burning of lignite ash, of lignite actually, which is used to uh, create electricity, which is, um, uh, you know, a basic sort of uh, aspect which we need to, to carry our lives with. It, it creates a very hazardous environment to, to live in. Uh, it produces a so-called lignite ash, which is then stored in these massive piles on the outskirts of Pristina, that um, um, any wind that blows kind of creates this dust, this haze over the city of Pristina, which unfortunately the citizens, most of us here, uh, breathe and have to live with it every day. Uh, a report by Kosovo uh, Ministry of Environment in 2003 uh, found that um, Kosovo A emits about 2.5 tons of dust every hour. And this is uh, about 74 times, uh, uh, sort of, uh, it exceeds the European standards. But it's quite an alarming thing to. Uh, to, to know and to find out uh, and, and to understand that, that this, these are the conditions that, that we live in. So, we as, as architects, you know, is there uh, anything that we can do about it when we sort of look at the lignite ash and think about you know, historical um, use of, of, of fly ash and, and the Romans, that they, were, uh, they used fly ash to create the cement. Uh, my question is, and I'm sure many of you wonder whether this product can be in any way used as a, as a building material at all. In uh, 2006, we were invited to be a part of an international consortium and to design the, one of the largest mixture developments in, in Balkans. Um, and this was an complex which was situated in the city of um, uh, so these are just some of the pictures that I uh, you know, was very excited talking about. So there's uh, you know, fields of, of dust uh, you know, which are created.
create these mountains that then you know, a small wind creates these brown clouds of lignite ash. So, apologies for the, uh, you can't see much in there, I guess, but in 2006 we were involved, uh, so we were invited to be part of the consortium, the international consortium to design uh, N Complex, which was uh, one of the largest development schemes in the Balkans, and the location is right in the center of Pristina, it's in the city center. Uh, the location here, um, it's um, uh, in an area which was, uh, according to urban regulating plan, it did not have any uh, sort of limits in terms of height. So, client, having paid a lot of money for the place, insisted that we have to maximize you know, the, the square meters and kind of build as, as high as possible. So during the initial process of design um, and knowing the conditions, the environmental conditions of Pristina as, as a city with this lignite ash problem, we sort of took it upon ourselves to uh, you know, uh, take a sample of, of lignite ash and, and, and we took it to London. We were working with, with Arabs, with uh, Arab associates. I'm not sure whether you're aware of them. They're one of the largest uh, structural engineering companies, but they have different departments as well. And we asked them to analyze the material and see whether this material is able to be transformed or to be used to create cement. And so the idea was to uh, you know, try and, and resolve this or at least tackle this environmental problem, this massive environmental problem that was part of uh, in the city of Pristina, to sort of transform these massive mountains of lignite ash into uh, a mountain of, of innovation, you know, because this new project was large and if we were able to uh, ensure that we can use it as a cement material, then we would, we would have achieved that. Now, the idea and the, the reality are, you know, two different things and, and uh, after several tests we found out from um, Arabs that for them to be able to approve or to actually say that yes, you can use this material as part of uh, cement making. And again, the, the idea of using cement for the main structure, you know, for this uh, uh, large development was because Kosovo was already producing some cement. So it was a local material, locally sourced, and also uh, we knew that there were people, laborers that you could get locally that could create a structure uh, using this sort of material. But the findings unfortunately uh, came back and, and, and uh, Arabs said that well we need to build a structure that is um, at least four or five, five story high with this material and we need to leave it there for 20 years and, and, and see how it evolves, see how it works. So there was this you know, 20 year time span which we had to wait in order to find out whether lignite ash can actually be used as a material to create cement and, and, then, the, and then whether we can use it for you know, the building here as well. So the timeline for this development was uh, eight years. So we went to our client, told them the results and uh, uh, obviously you know, they were not interested because we can wait 20 years to, to have this development. We also discussed uh, the same thing with government. Unfortunately, at that time, the government wasn't too interested in, 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 in this sort of experimentation. So, um, the lignite ash remains, in a way, a mystery you know, for all of us. Uh, and, and it's still, we sort of uh, question how we can get rid of this environmental pollutant. So, maybe, it is time for us today, and then this is obviously a, a, a question or an idea posed to you. Maybe we can, you know, as a group, as a whole, pose this question or actually instigate the process to, to do these sort of experimentations and, and uh, to, to maybe raise funds from the government or, or whoever to find out whether lignite ash can indeed be used as a cement or not. But because if it can, that it can sort it can sort out um, a lot of problems. So uh, this was one aspect of, of sustainable design which we tried to tackle um, and, and unfortunately we were you know, unable to, to, to do so. Um, 
But the, the projects like these, you know, the large developments where you have uh, investors willing to invest large sums of money, uh, they uh, pose uh, you know, huge opportunities. And um, us as architects have to, you know, maybe be able to, to kind of try and, and understand the depth and see what other opportunities, are, opportunities would be there beyond the actual form, you know, beyond the structure. You know, this development was uh, you know, 298,907 square meters, roughly. So the potential jobs that would be created here were about 20,000. Now, how, um, you know, how do you uh, uh, make a project like this serve the community? You know, not only uh, not only to look at it in terms of the square meters, in terms of uh, how much money can um, you know the developer make out of it, but but how can you actually uh, create something like this that, that that to engage the community, to actually serve the community, to, to enable the community, so to, to strengthen them. So we. Um, looked at, uh, again, the situation that we were in, and this is all in 2006, 2007, and we were you know, working here with, with um, also local architects were engaged, like ANARC, and uh, also international ones uh, um, like from Greece and from Macedonia and from the UK, and so it was a group of, of people, uh, international people that were involved in, in, in thinking and bringing ideas um, to, uh, to the forefront. Um, we thought that uh, you know, the war uh, created uh, a, a condition where a lot of people had to leave the country. A lot of Kosovoans had moved out, uh, like well, more than one million people were displaced, but all, more than half a million people uh, live around the world. And, and these uh, Kosovans have uh, been living there for more than 20 years and they have established roots I and mean, they created their businesses, they have families, um, and, and, but they make uh, trips back to Kosovo at least one, once a year. Uh, so this development here was then, um, uh, we had a timeline for it, so it was supposed to be finished in, in, in eight years. So the question was what can we do within eight years here in Kosovo to involve the community, to actually uh, enable the community to, to link to the diaspora, to sort of link to the sort of global, uh, global market. Because uh, development like this has uh, 100,000 square meters of, of administration space, for example, and so that's a lot of office space. It has, uh, it's a mixed use development, to, in, in, so it has residences, it has retail and then hotel, and the idea was that uh, this, uh, from a sustainable point of view, minimizes the need for transport, but also it has large amounts of um, uh, you know, working space. And the local economy of Kosovo and, and the um, sort of governmental structures at that point in time were not able to really, you know, businesses didn't have that many businesses that would, would occupy all these spaces in this building. Now you have the client's needs and wants, you know, the money that is being paid for this to be developed, and then you have the local economy which is, you know, not doing that great, um, uh, or not doing good at all. You have, uh, but then you have things like 40% or 50% unemployment. You have a young, the youngest uh, uh, population in Europe, very intelligent, English speaking, very driven and willing to work and learn. So. The idea to, uh, was that while this process of development of ENK happens, uh, we would also tap in into or link, bring in the community as part of the development, and then uh, link the development to educational systems, you know, to governments, and, and kind of brainstorm about what professions could be involved in, um, you know, to rent space or to, to buy space within this development. Because we have IT, for example, that doesn't rely on physical you know, space. I mean, you can be in, in Pristina and you can do work for the United States or uh, Australia or United Kingdom. You can be an architect and do the same. You can be in, mar in marketing or telesales and so on and so forth. And, and, and you can actually work from Pristina 
but be involved in these global opportunities and global markets. Um, as, as a result, um, uh, we actually um, uh, decided to, to open up our own office here. So uh, since that time, we have our own presence in, in UK, in um, sorry, in Kosovo, which uh, has helped us be more competitive in global markets because. Having an office in the UK, you can compete with UK companies. Uh, but if you want to compete with the markets like, let's say, Nigeria in Africa, or let's say India, or uh, you know any other market that actually pays a lot less than what United Kingdom pays, it is very difficult to get projects. But if you link United Kingdom and Kosovo, for example, where um, you know the market here is not. Um, as high as what, what it is in, in, in the UK in terms of pay, then all of a sudden you have opportunities. You have more opportunities for the hosting country, let's say UK, and obviously you have opportunities, you're creating opportunities outside of the economical conditions in Kosovo, and you're enabling people, you're actually getting people uh, in the jobs and competing and doing, carrying out uh, projects globally. So uh, a, a, a structure like this was, was um, uh, seen as uh, um, an important sort of physical structure to enable uh, that the city of Pristina overcomes the local problems in terms of the economy, in terms of the government, and uh, links globally. So um, this was the other aspect of, of sustainability. Another, another aspect was, uh, you know, the technological aspect, which, uh, you know, the computational design analysis, which uh, we as, as a company sort of uh, developed um, uh, within our, our office to sort of um, parametricize the systems and kind of create a, a structure, create a, uh, 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 sort of a, a system, like a facade system, that acts intelligently. So, um, you know, that it doesn't sort of, uh, it is not only, or it's not aesthetic, kind of pleasing view or look uh, of the building, but actually it is an intelligent system that, um, uh, you know, the system that actually created this, this sort of facade or this look is based uh, on, on nine components only. And those nine components, uh, uh, they can be sort of uh, modified or, or brought together in, in a lot of different ways, which then can create a system that uh, spaces an external environment. So it also thinks about orientation. You know, it deals differently with south, where you have most of the sun, or the west. Uh, and then, again, you have another system which deals with the north, where you have no sun, or, or the east. It also deals with relationships of uh, the vicinity of, of the actual building to the next door building, and also the building itself with a context as well. And as a result, in, in 2008, uh, we, we uh, submitted this as part of the Green Sky Thinking, and uh, we were selected as one of the top 50 sustainable design studios um, in, in the UK out of thousands, which uh, you know we were obviously very proud of, and also uh, the pride comes more than when this project was actually being thought to be developed in, 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 in Kosovo. Uh, talking about these sort of um, technology or computational designs to be used as, as uh, tools for, for sustainable design, we were involved in another project here in Kosovo uh, in uh, 2004, and, and the project was um, you know, City Centre 1 or Chandra Ne. Um, uh, this, this um, uh, we we uh, were out to, to carry out the master planning or the urban regulating uh, plan and we um, uh, used or developed in-house tools of, of computational design and, and computational design allows you to develop programs that takes a lot of parameters and, and then compute, compute them uh, in order to find out uh, what the actual uh, site is, is revealing or is telling you. 
because by default, you know, eco is ecological or ecological. You have a whole system of different parameters that you have to look into and bring them together in order to find out uh, what the outcomes would be. Um, as a, um, a you know, these are some of the um, analysis we've carried out. I, I'm not going to sort of get into detail, but um, I'll just point out to the important aspects which we felt uh, we need to bring and we need to, to understand. You know, the historical, um, the historical uh, aspect, we felt that it is extremely important. Uh, you see some historical maps, which I'm not sure if you can see them clearly, but um, you can see sort of the evolution of Pristina as a city. And, um, and we sort of analyzed these uh, routes or the, the, the roads uh, which were kind of um, the life of the city uh, during the history. Um, and, and we then looked into what has happened during, um, you know, kind of the communist era and the modern era. And we found out that there were a lot of sort of blockages that, uh, a lot of interventions that didn't consider our history, our traditions, our heritage. So in a way there was a sort of very chop, very artificial cut from uh, this historical evolution in terms of, in terms of buildings, in terms of um, uh, roads and routes and so on. And, and also um, in terms of, um, yeah, our kind of um, uh, various, um, you know, uh, building methods that we've used previously. It was this sort of massive, massive shift. There was no continuation. Um, and, and we felt that, that, that these aspects are important to be pointed out and, and where possible for them to be restored. Uh, so, uh, one of the um, ideas that, that emerged as a result of these analyses was, you know, uh, the, the concept of demolition. Demolition as a sustainable tool. You know, because you had um, you know, a lot of bottlenecks that were created, and a lot of things that didn't work naturally the way you know, humans being, human beings work, the way we actually use the way we experience the city, they were just totally artificial. They were implanted on top of something, on top of a layer of a system that existed there previously. So, demolition as an urban tool uh, came, um, you know, as part of our concept to uh, create the urban regulating plan for um, the city center of, of Pristina, whereby we, again, we analyzed, we had to analyze, uh, you know, the the feasibility of it in terms of, uh, again, from an, from an urban point of view, from an architectural point of view, from a financial point of view, but more so from the community point of view and, and again, the political willingness to enact. Because, uh, you know, you have a lot of stumbling blocks that you have to take into account in order uh, to push something or to make something work. Um, another aspect which, uh, you know, I found very interesting is, is that uh, well, we, we carried out a lot of workshops you know, with business people, with uh, students, with uh, uh, people from, from all demographics because uh, we, feel that we felt that it is important to get all these perspectives in view to understand um, you know, how they feel about the city and the problems. And, and I would like to sort of highlight uh, our workshop with, with children, with kids. And these were children of ages uh, between 6 and 14 years. And um, when you're carrying out these workshops, you know, because we've done quite a lot in, in, for many different projects in different parts of the world, but it is very important that you are, you remain very, very simple. You have to ask a very simple question. Because if you start asking complex questions, then, you know, you go all over. You get a lot of information, but you get nowhere. So, um, a very simple question was posed to these children, and they're children, obviously, so you have to be simple. It's like, how do you experience Pristina now, and, and how would you like it to be in 2020? And the now was 2005, this was then. So, um, it was um, kids, you know, by default, they kind of not not cluttered, you know, they're not like grown-ups. We grown-ups 
uh, we clutter our brains with a lot of ideas. We're like, oh, you know, shall I say this? Shall I say that? Am I going to be right in saying this? Or what if I say that? Maybe I get misunderstood, and so on and so forth. But what you get from kids, you get a question and a clear answer. It's very sort of one-liner, very clear, very straightforward. So we actually found a lot from from um, you know uh, children, and, and I just want to uh, share this this drawing from you uh, with you, um, where um, you know this this uh, student, this child, um, he pointed out, he said, okay, this is 2005. There's a line 2020. This is how I see it now. That's how I want it. And, and you can see here that you have this basketball without basket. What does he want? He wants the same thing with a basket, functional. Swing without a, sw without a seat. Basically he wants the swing with a seat. Ping pong table without uh, net. He wants a ping pong table with net. So it, it, it's very clear that, that um, again, his idea, his vision about what needs doing is actually that, well, actually, we have everything we need. We just have to make them functional because they've been destroyed. They don't work. We need to take responsibility and we need to, to look after them and, and take care of them. So, um, you know, these uh, parameters um, became kind of our guiding principles together with, with our um, you know, computational analysis and methodologies and obviously all the other uh, analysis that we carried out. And then we created you know, a, vision, a vision for the city center, for the city of Pristina, where we created a large public platform and um, um, so on and so forth. I won't get into detail, but uh, what happened from the vision uh, in 2005 to uh, where a lot of other master plans were being carried out to uh, today, we stand at 2014 and we look at our city. Um, you know, we had a lot of ideas, uh, we had a lot of interesting ideas, but but unfortunately, um, you know, our cities, uh, this is what has happened to them. Now, what, what, is, what is the problem? Why? Why has why this happened? Why is this happening? Um, another issue was that us, as, prof as a profession, architects, urban planners, you know, this sort of pointing out, yeah, no, it's your fault, no, it's his fault, no, it's their fault, and so on and so forth. So nobody was prepared uh, or willing to take responsibility or even dare to get into depth to analyze why, you know, from then till now, we created a massive chaos, you know, a mess, which Pristina finds itself today. And I'm not saying that there are not good examples. You know, there are good examples, a lot of good examples, uh, which obviously we have to look hard to find them. But, but the initial view, like people that come here and visit us, this is what they see. This is us. Uh, in 2012, uh, we were, uh, Mr. Kabashi, uh, he's not here, um, but, but um, so we were lucky uh, to be selected to present Kosovo um, Pavilion in Venice Biennale um, in 2012. Now this is the first time that Kosovo is presenting, uh, would be presenting in, in the Venice Biennale. <laughs> And um, it was a, quite a huge task, quite a mammoth task, because if you go to, to Venice, you know, you see all of these countries trying to sort of present the latest and the best and, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of, um, uh, you know, architecture and, and what they have achieved. But, but us as, as, as Kosovars, we, we have, um, as far as I'm concerned, we sort of, um, by that time, we had failed to even understand what we as a society think about our architecture, you know, where we are, what, what do we appreciate, what do we respect, what do we see as negative, um, uh, where, we, where do we want to go, what is the direction, you know, a lot of questions which were unanswered and, and, and you know, we remain in this, you know, this is what is happening, you know, others are, are developing, are creating and this is what they're creating, whereas us, we remain, you know, um, uh, kind of um, on this cloud and we don't know where we are. So, so 
this was the basis of kind of um, um, uh, developing maybe a concept that would highlight uh, the Kosovan architecture as it truly is, as it as it truly stands. You know what? Uh, who are we in terms of architecture and urban planning? Where are we? Where do we stand? What is you know what is Kosovan architecture? And um, we thought that it is very important that we have to be very simple, we have to be bold, we have to be true, we have to be honest, we have to be real, and we have to be us. You know, we have to, to get to know ourselves, and not be scared to actually, um, you know, look into ourselves and understand what we truly are. Because without knowing where we are, where we stand, I don't think we can move forward. You know, it's, 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 you know, we just continue with, with this sort of chaos. So, um, again, going back to asking, you know, the idea was sort of come from the children's workshop, asking very, very simple questions and filtering it through these sort of um, uh, emotions. We asked, um, again, we had like a month and a half or two months to, um, to, to um, uh, develop the, the pavilion and uh, so we thought that, okay, we, we are going initially to ask uh, the Kosovan community of architects and urban planners to upload images of Kosovan architecture but filtered through six emotions which was, you know, happy, sad, free, entrapped, angry and excited. Now, this in a way just created, you know, a filtering system. A filtering system of positive, three positive emotions and three negative emotions. So again, keeping it very, very simple. Uh, what we wanted to find out is, is um, again, uh, we wanted to reveal the true you know, nature of Kosovan architecture. And, and because we had uh, these six emotions, three positive, three negative, we had um, images uploaded, like thousands of images, you know, very quickly. Like a Kosovan architecture that we were, you know, or we see, that made us you know, feel happy or positive in terms of emotions. I'll keep it simple in two, or negative. And um, and the findings again. Now I'll divide them. That that you can then look at at, at kind of uh, typologies. Like we didn't ask what do you think about religious buildings. We didn't ask what do you think about communist era buildings. We didn't ask about what do you think about historical buildings or about new buildings and so on. We literally asked for them to upload images um, based on these emotions. But then this system, a simple question, allows you to analyze what's happening. And what happened was that we found out that actually religious buildings, so that's the positive and this is negative, you know, Catholic, uh, you know, they, they kind of, they were positioned on, on the uh, positive. And the one that was negative was actually, you know, this uh, the, 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 the church, the Orthodox Church, which again I think we have like a political link, political connection to it, which was which was negative. And it was sad. You see, it one is a sad emotion. I think that internationals again thought that it was sad, maybe for totally different reasons to us. But I won't get into that. The other thing is that uh, again uh, on the communist times buildings, you had. A, all the buildings were kind of grouped or voted into these negative feelings. Only the public spaces and, and one, two buildings were like uh, into, into the positives. Um, historical buildings, they were all, all in positive um, uh, sort of emotion. Um, so, so again, what, what that tells me um, uh, in a way is that um, um, Maybe, you know, this is what, what we're proud of. This is what we'd like to show to others, that we would like to share. Whereas, uh, you know, things like this, which are kind of new buildings, we don't really like them, we don't care for them, we don't appreciate them. They're, they're down here. And then you get all these sort of different styles. And so, uh, but would we appreciate public spaces. Uh, so, how can we use this information, you know, to transform the Kosovan architecture? So again, you know, it was a simple question about totally something else. We've got a lot of wealth of information, 
and enabled us to, to see, to capture the kind of uh, uh, social consciousness of, of how we as Kosovans see ourselves and what we appreciate. And also the other aspect which I presented previously and, and don't want to get into it at this time was that how actually the world sees us. And, and we did have some overlaps, uh, but, but, um, uh, which, which was very, very interesting. Um, so that information, again, um, again, I'm presenting here our, our own uh, projects at different scales. Um, we uh, were invited to design uh, an interior space here, interior architecture space in, in Pristina. Um, and uh, it was a jazz bar and it was, the situation was uh, on the basement of this 14-story building. And this building was made out of concrete. So we set our own parameters, said okay, if we are going to build something here, I mean, to be involved in this project, then we want to create something with local materials. Only local materials. Only materials that uh, we can get and can source here in Kosovo. And as a, in a way, as a joke, we asked, okay, what is you know, the material that we can get here very easily and cheaply and, and, and you know, mud came to, we have a lot of mud. A lot of mud and straw. And that kind of became as our guiding, guiding material, uh, which we uh, started transforming this space. Um, and then, you know, everything that was um, part of the interior was again sourced locally, built locally, built it with local materials. Um, another um, uh, challenge that we faced here was uh, was that um, uh, creating a jazz club or like a music sort of destination in, in a concrete building. Like the sound and concrete, they don't work well together. You have you know, echoes uh, uh, which you have to deal with. But what we found is that these um, um, uh, mud panels created, which we suspended them from the ceiling, and we actually suspended them, so they move. If you touch them, they move. They're not stuck. They actually, they're suspended with fish wire. Uh, they created this uh, field of um, echo surface or echo buffer that uh, uh, dealt with, with the problem of, of, of sound echo. Now, moreover, uh, you know, that, so, so this was kind of um, uh, a space which was created again with, with using totally just local material, local know-how, local designers. I mean, I'm, I'm from here, even though I live in London. Um, and, um, and, and so, it was uh, a space that was unlike um, anywhere else, and then we uh, entered it into competition. And in uh, last year, in 2013, we won the award for the best bar design in the world, which, which was fantastic. I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's a great thing. And I think the greatest thing of them all was that uh, um, it kind of provides, I feel, and, and obviously you can agree or disagree with me, I mean, you're here, is that it gives us confidence as, as, a, as a young nation, as a nation that we are going through uh, tough uh, economical and environmental conditions. So this gives us confidence that, okay, well, if this can win globally, and if this is seen as great, then we can obviously do it. We, we can do it. And I believe that, that, you, uh, uh, that you as a young generation, and most of you are students, uh, are able to, to um, to do this without any hesitation, and, and this has um, acted as, as an inspiration. And, and I think that now, since last year, we have other companies that are competing, and they actually, you know, won won awards, which is um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, that's, that's great. So, uh, new technology today, you know, um, allows us or there is new technology out there, there are people out there that are working on, on systems uh, that, that enable us to, to be, we are able to source very cheaply and bring, you know, well, have them anywhere around the world, and, and create materials that are locally sourced that, um, uh, you know, are sustainable, are environmentally friendly, again, are simply done, they have a very low ecological footprint 
uh, which is you know extremely important, and and they they enable um, you know local uh, uh, people. They give them sort of power, and, and in different the, the, the technology in different parts of the world, they're using it differently. For example, in Switzerland, you know they have robots that uh, now they're using new technology. They're using software to uh, use very sort of simple local traditional materials, but um, uh, kind of transformed in terms of um, uh, you know form in terms of you know, light, in terms of tactility, and so on and so forth, into very exciting new forms. Um, and, um, and also, uh, again, you know, we have sort of robots that in a very precise way they can sort of uh, point out these um, materials into, into um, you know, whatever form we like. So now, Looking back into our culture, into our history, into our tradition, and looking at, at, at our heritage, uh, looking at these sort of architectural buildings, architectural samples, uh, you know, I wonder, is there anything that we can do, um, you know, to, to actually look back into history uh, and look into our heritage but use new technology to create, I'm not saying to replicate, I mean, no, challenge, no way saying that we have to copy and paste that or, or create that, but is there a way, is there a way that we can, um, you know, use the new technologies being used globally to actually use our locally sourced material, source materials to create new architectures, to create uh, a new uh, kind of sustainable identity, green identity uh, for, for our uh, nation. And um, I don't know if you guys watched the um, uh, Serbia Albania game. Yeah. You watch it, yeah. So having watched that, I think that we we kind of have a, an interest. You know, maybe we could use drones. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Uh, it's an idea, right? Um, and, and actually, you know, joking aside, the drones, or, or these are being used. You know, ETH in Zurich, they're actually doing a lot of experiments with, with these swarm intelligence, whereby, uh, you know, you have the material stored in one place, and then you have a computational program and design of the building, and then these drones, uh, they have this global positioning system uh, that they can they can actually build a building, you know, so, so it, it is happening out there. But now, again, this is just a teaser, but, you know, is there anything, like, we need to, to again, to, to build confidence within ourselves and to continue experimenting, or actually start experimenting, if we haven't done so, to, you know, to, to, to sort of uh, um, interrogate these new ideas of, of development. Uh, so, you know, we've kind of looking back to, to our city uh, and, and the post-war. Uh, what, what, what were the uh, aspects that, that I could look into and learn from? So maybe, you know, possible use of lignite ash to make cement, cement for constructing new buildings. Uh, at the same time, cleaning up the city, so cleaning up our, uh, getting rid of this brown uh, haze that, that, that is over our city all the time. Also learned that large-scale developments uh, provide massive opportunities, and we have to seize them. They provide opportunities beyond sort of the physical form, physical architectural form. And I think that us as architects, we have to think beyond physical architectural form. We have to think about the community. We have to think about how we engage them, because that's the only way to create truly sustainable and lasting architecture. Also, in terms of uh, you know looking at the uh, situation or the context, we um, uh, had uh, we go, we gone through terrible times through war, and, and that war, uh, yeah, almost a million were displaced and now half a million live abroad. But from that negative aspect, there's a positive. The positive is that because of diaspora, we as Kosovans here can link actually can have can can link to these. Uh, 
markets around the world, and, and that is that is very, very positive, and I think that we should utilize that. The government should be made aware, I'm sure they are, but we as a profession, again, we should uh, you know, push this forward and, and, and link it to these developments. Like in terms of urban planning, in terms of uh, regulating uh, laws, uh, there has to be a law that says the development beyond these four meters has to be looked at beyond architecture and how we actually link into the community and how we develop the community as a whole. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, Chandra 1, you know, the, the uh, urban regulating plan, like the aspect of uh, analysis and actually thinking about demolition as a sustainable tool. It can be. It can be because, uh, because of the chaos that was created, because of actually political agendas and so on and so forth, the city can be destroyed or it can be uh, tied down and, and it can be dying because of these bottlenecks. And we need to identify them and we need to use demolition as an urban tool, demolition as, as development. Um, and, and also, uh, I've learned that you have to, again, engage all uh, parts of demographics. You, know, you have to engage, uh, including children, you, you cannot underestimate them because I found out that actually we learn most from the children. The information was clear. There's the question, there's the answer. So that was, that was uh, you know, beautiful. Uh, so, um, historical analysis as well. You know, we cannot leave behind uh, our history. We cannot just build on top of something with sort of neglecting uh, you know, the historical evolution or, or you know, our tradition, our culture, <coughs> Um, uh, you know, previous sort of um, architectural and urban developments, uh, we cannot neglect them because by neglecting them, we're again we're cutting off. It's like it's this tree with very short roots that a very uh, small wind can, can blow us away. We need to link deep into our uh, heritage, into our culture, into our tradition, uh, into these sort of uh, uh, you know, historical evolution of the past of these roads and streets and functions and again religious, um, uh, cultural and, and so on and so forth. It is very important uh, because uh, these rooting deep uh, would give us, provides uh, uh, confidence for us as a nation. So, uh, and, and confidence is a basis for innovation. Uh, from the Kosovo Pavilion, we um, have learned um, again the, the importance of actually utilizing or using the, the, the new technology to, to capture the sort of uh, social consciousness and to use these new tools, to use new technology as, as uh, information to help us, to enable us um, you know, with, with new projects and with dealing with new issues and also to sort of uh, democratize um, you know, the aspect of, of decision making at a big scale. Like uh, the tool that, that, that uh, we developed for the Kosovo Pavilion maybe you know, with another question could be posed, posed by, by, um, you know, uh, urban, um, uh, by the uh, municipality or by the government and, and a large population can be engaged in decision making and, and I'm not saying that that information should be taken as it, like the professional should take that as an important information in their decision making process. So the new, te new technology today allows us to capture you know, the, this information. Um, and with, with Hamam Jazz Bar, which is you know, small, but um, um, I've learned that, that everything starts from you, and it starts from me, it starts from, from us. That, uh, we need to build confidence. You know, we need to, uh, 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 to look at our own selves or to have the confidence to look at our own selves, to recognize who we are, to recognize uh, what, our, what our city is, where we live in, to actually understand our city truly at a deeper level and uh, to understand the places where we live and work. Because again, you know, the confidence is the basis for innovation and without it we cannot innovate. We'll replicate, we'll copy, but we'll not innovate. And our understanding of ourselves and our surroundings opens uh, eyes to the potentials that, that surround us. So we look at, at, at our own potentials. 
and, and help us build towards a, a more sustainable future, so towards a, a green identity. Thank you.